Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Steady Focused. I'm your host, I'm your number one, Mr. Simeon Hendricks. In this episode, we're bringing back in Mr. Mike Badalino. He's a great friend of mine, and I'm excited to shine the light on his story one more time. He is the epitome of consistency, and guys, without any further ado, help me give a huge, steady, focused welcome to my friend, Mr. Mike Badalino. What's up, What's Mike? What's up, man? How are you? Uh, man, I'm doing awesome. It's, uh, it's great to see you. I love your um, your sweatshirt. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah the uh, I told you the logo. It's kind. Of, it'll be kind of hard to see, but the the Kronos logo that my buddy redid for me, my buddy Ben Clairdad, yeah, uh, amazing yeah. artist and musician and weightlifting coach. Just a really, uh, just a really good dude. Uh, yeah, I, would, yeah. I would check his stuff out. His stuff is Oakham Athletics. So yeah. it's O C C A M yeah. underscore Athletics out of California. Uh, in in Sacramento, just a good dude, and of course, as soon as we start this, Santa, my gym dog, is uh, you know, she starts crying. She, she wants so, to. So, she she wants to be part of the conversation. Oh, absolutely, she wants to be part of everything. So she's named Santa after Santa's little helper in The Simpsons. Because hey. Santa's little helper was, was a terrible dog. Santa's a pretty bad dog, but she's very she's very very loving and she's amazing with Ella. So we keep her around in addition to the other three. So. Man, yeah. as as we're preparing for this episode, mm. I, I'm going through and I'm researching about Mike Badalino and 10 years, 10 years you have been documenting your workouts. Yeah. And yeah. man, that I this last couple of days I've been kind of, you know, you know, we've talked a lot about my my mantra that I've been having a lot lately, I'm really thankful is today's the only day, you know, just yeah. one day at a time. And this today, I felt a little getting um, shaken off the path a little bit and those expectations and those, those what ifs and kind of gnawing at me, you know, those, those demons kind of popping up. And then I'm just 10 years, man. So I, you know, it just got me thinking like, do, are you, does anger and rage come into your mind? Like, like, why haven't I hit X yet? Is, is there this, is there this spot you're trying to reach and, and you felt frustrated you're not there yet? Uh, that's a good question. And you, you mentioned the E word. I, t I told you what, uh, yes. What expectations are, right? Yes. Yeah. Expectations are re resentments under construction. So, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of who I got that from. Um, I don't know if it was David Kessler. It might have been David Kessler. So David Kessler is a, a grief expert. Maybe it was him. But for sure, the moment that I read that, I was like, hmm, yeah. So uh, expectations are something you have to be very, very careful with. Uh, because when you set an expectation for yourself that you, you have to hit this number by this date, and if you don't, you are, I don't know, you're worthless. And that's a big, that's something that I've always struggled with, which is uh, correlating, correlating goals with self-worth. So okay. if, I, if I don't hit this by this day, then, I, then, I'm not wor then I'm worthless. And that's really, I haven't been maybe quite that extreme, but for sure, you know, whenever I set a goal and then I, that, and I failed to meet that goal. Yeah, uh, there there have been times when I, you know, th I just beat myself up about it. And it, it probably, I really didn't start setting goals for myself until I was, mm, I think it was a junior or senior in high school. And I, I think I shared a little bit about this with you. And when I, uh, I, I, I was really overweight. I was total. I was not athletic at all. I was not. I was about the weight I am now when I was seventeen. But it wasn't like it wasn't like a good look. Okay, I wasn't okay. like 10% body fat or anything. Uh, so I dropped a ton of weight, but that was the first time that I had set goals to do anything. So I'm like, oh, I want to run this far, and then I want to run this far. I, I was into that running thing. I gave that up, okay? It, it didn't last very long. And that's then I found the weights. But, you know, maybe I, I, I didn't learn how to set realistic goals and then how to – 
I guess, recalibrate whenever you fail to meet those goals. It took me a very long time to, to figure out what to do because I've always had extremely high expectations for myself and probably in many instances, unrealistic expectations because for a long time, I just, I chased perfection. And that's just, I don't know, it, my own opinion for myself is just ridiculous because you're, we're not perfect. I mean, there's no, and there's no, nor should we be. Uh, we should strive to be better, but, you know, perfection is this, uh, Brene Brown, okay, so it has yeah. this has this saying that per, if if there was a uh, convention convention for I think recovering perfectionists, we would fill football stadiums. And, mm. and there's no, there's no question to that because we and society helps put a lot of that pressure on us too, right? Because you know we're constantly surrounded by you know well you know if if you only lost this much weight or if you only made this much money, then you yeah. would you know. Yeah then you would, you, you would be better. You know what I mean? Like you would yeah. have, you would have everything that you want. If then, you know, if this, then you become happy as opposed to, you know, cultivating gratitude in your day-to-day -day life. That's not the, that's not what we're selling as society, right? You know, we're, we're selling, you know, you have to, you know, get up, at, get up at three in the morning, grind for 12 hours, come home, uh, do a two hour workout, read your, read your kids in five different languages, uh, just all of these totally unrealistic expectations. And there's the E word again, right? Mm. So I threw a bunch of stuff at you. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, the expectations. So so along this this journey that you've been on for yeah. at, at at a minimum of 10 years, I know it's been going on longer than that that you've been lifting. Like 50, so, yeah, 50, about 15, yeah. So yeah, 15 years. I'll be honest. My issue was that I was tripping on was because I've been working out with you again. You know, I'm on the Kronos strength team again mm -hmm. and I'm seeing myself again more. And I'm like, man, my my belly. Why is it so big? I know why it's so big. OK, well, and then all of this expectations, you know, shouldn't be this big. Well, you know why it's this big? Well, get it off today. Well, damn it. I got to get that belly off today. And then again, I'm I'm seeing that you've been doing this for 10 years so, uh, yeah, just have, have you hit that point where you're just, I'm going to give up? I don't think I've quite gotten there. You know, I've certainly, I've gotten frustrated to the point where I'm like, uh, why do I bother putting so much effort into something <clears throat> only to have these, and I don't mean failure like capital F failure. I mean, like these small failures over and over again, right? Yeah. And as an example, you've you've filmed a couple times this year when I just had, I, I just, I couldn't put a, a decent deadlift together in training. And uh, the deadlift is always, what sucks about missing a deadlift for me is that I really just, I, I enjoy locking out heavy deadlifts. It, it, it's just a very gratifying feeling when you've left absolutely everything on the table. So, the couple of times this year that you've captured my inability to, you know, to, to realize what I, you know, the plan that I had in mind or the goal that I had. So those are, those are good. Those are good moments to video. Cause I'm like, oh, okay. Like uh, wh what happened? I I'm really, really, I'm, I'm so much better in competition than I am in training with deadlifts in particular. I, I have no idea what it is, but, there's about another 5% on the table with the adrenaline of a crowd mm. that I just, I've never been able to replicate in training. I mean, I've had the best deadlifts I've ever had have all been in competition. I've had some solid deadlifts in training, but nothing like I've ever had in competition. I mean, those are always the most effortless and most fun deadlifts. Uh, but, but yeah, <sighs> have I thought about throwing in the towel? Yeah. Surely you have over these yeah. 15 yeah. years. Sure. Uh, and I guess recently, within the past couple, probably less often than I ever have, and that's because awesome. that's awesome. I'm just way I'm way more okay with failing. And uh, I think for a long time, I let other people's expectations control what I, I thought you know I should be doing for myself. So mm. I should compete this many times, or I should you know I, I should work on this thing in order to do. Or, or, or go to this particular competition competition to do better here. And after a while, I was just like, I, I don't care what anyone else thinks about what I should be doing. I, like I can, 
you know, I, I can take in what they're saying and, and say, hmm, what, is there anything good there that I can that I can draw from? But really, it's up to me to decide what I want to do. You know, yeah. Uh, no one is no one is forcing me to compete. No one is forcing me to train any of that. So, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of marched to the beat of my own drum a little bit with uh, with all of this, and I think you know the the folks on the team have kind of figured that out. Yeah. Um, I, I've I've gleaned a lot from a lot of different people over the years, but but really, I you know I try to just apply you know, a practical, uh, practically apply, apply strength training principles to what I do, right? Um, I'm not going to train for four hours a day. Uh, I'm not going to sleep, be able to sleep for 10 hours a night. You know, I have a, a life totally outside of this gym. And I, I talked about this in that Texas video a couple of years ago, but yeah, you know, if I become only this, uh, then what happens if I lose this, you know, cause uh, yeah. t- I could have already had my last training session for all I know. I mean, I, God, I hope not. Uh, but, you know, you never know when your last training session is. You never know when your last opportunity to PR is. So you just got to you got to be wise. Uh, but again, this isn't called this isn't called smart man. You know, I've mentioned that to you before. It's called strong man. <laughs> if, I, if I was a smart man, I might not do this. Recently, it seems like <clears throat> you've um, maybe I want to say that you've kind of found a new interest or a new hobby in consuming books on a on a on a massive scale it seems like so over this 2020 you've you mentioned Brene Brown I know you've gone through a lot of books focused on uh, leadership mental health loving ourselves things like that what's been one of the books that's really spoken to you Uh, okay so if we're going to talk about books the first book that I need to mention pretty much every time I talk about books is Every human being needs to read Victor Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning. Every oh, human being needs to read that. I, I agree. I completely agree. And I'm freaking pumped that you mentioned a book that I've already consumed. Yeah, it's uh, – so I listen to, I don't know, 15 or 20 different podcasts. I read a variety of different books, a bunch of different periodicals. And all of the things that I read and consume, I cannot tell you how often people mention – you know, I was reading Man's Search for Meaning or, uh, hey, uh, this one book, Man's Search for Meaning, or if you really want to look, hear something about someone that can overcome just extraordinary circumstances, read Man's Search for Meaning. So Man's Search for Meaning is the number one. I probably I probably should reread that every single year. I, I think that's oh, probably that's a good, good practice. And perhaps perhaps in 2021, I kick off 2021 and I reread Man's Search for Meaning again. I don't think that's mm. a bad I don't think that's a bad idea at all. I like that. I'm, I'm going to take that challenge. I'm going to take that challenge with you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do that then. Let's read yes. it. Let's start January 1st. Let's start reading Man's Search for Meeting again. Okay. Anybody uh, out there, that. you want to get on this train or come along oh, with oh, us? Oh, oh, Simeon, we got stuff in the chat box, man. Oh, Simeon. yeah. We, oh, yeah. We oh, got oh, it's people logged in. Oh, 92.5%. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brad. Uh, it's, it's, we're almost there after next week. I'll, I'll, I'll be at 93% for my doctorate. That's what oh, he's, uh, oh, that's, no. that's, what he, that's what he's getting at. That's what he's getting at. Brad wanted yeah. to make sure we mentioned that, that yeah. Brad wanted to make sure. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that a bit later. And that's, uh, we'll get into why one of the reasons that I want to get my doctorate is happy Gilmore, but that's, oh my uh, gosh. We'll, we'll, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, put that on pause. It's, it's, it's yeah, tape. It's not even a joke. That's for real. I, and I want to hear this. I want to hear this. But okay. let me issue this challenge to everybody who's listening okay. out there who wants to come along with us. So you heard it here, January first, twenty twenty one. Mike and I are both going to reconsume Victor Frankel's "Man's Search for Meaning." So, guys, get it on Audible. Get the book, uh, the paperback, the hard book, whatever. And come along with us, and we're going to take a look. Mike, why don't you give him just a, a few sentences about what this book is? Oh, gosh, man. Uh, so a psychologist named Viktor Frankl was, was taken by the Nazis. He was in a concentration camp, lost everything, watched and experienced the most profound suffering experienced by uh, just an, an entire generation of, of humans. It was awful. But the the way that he got through it demonstrates what we are capable of as human beings. Mm. And it's not, you know, 
gosh, we could go on this long tangent about comparative suffering. So, you know, I, I didn't experience that. So why should I be complaining? That's not a, uh, comparative suffering is not a good thing. Uh, however, seeing what someone else is capable of going through and knowing that if you are a human being with a beating heart, you can get through, you can get through whatever you're going through because you're, you're capable of it, you know? And sometimes we, I, I don't think we, uh, we give ourselves enough credit, you know, for what our, uh, for what our species has endured. Uh, so yeah, that, that, wow. in, in that respect, um, learning what our true capabilities are and just learning how to reframe our experiences. Yeah. It's such a just unbelievable book, but the number of times that I hear people much smarter than me recommend that book and yeah. say, you know, everyone really needs to read man's search for me. Everyone really needs to read man's search for me, especially after 2020. Well, there you so, go. So yeah, guys, uh, uh, January 1st, 2021, come along with us and we're going to re consume that book. So Mike, let's talk about 93% and why are you on this journey? Why do you want to be a doctor of education? Dude. All right. So first thing is that uh, I've always wanted to get a doctorate and uh, there's a, there's a few reasons for that. Man, I, some of my the reasons that I do things for, I'm like, you know, I, 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 laugh. I have to laugh sometimes, okay? So one of them is that going through high school, I had a teacher, and I, I won't call him out by name, but good dude, good dude. And when I move back to Connecticut, and I know we'll talk about that later, but when I move back to Connecticut, I'm going to reconnect with him uh, because you remember – you remember the teacher's names that left a real impact on your life. You, you yes, definitely do. That is true. So he looked at me one day. He goes, Mike, he's like, I was in the teacher's lounge today. And I couldn't believe what this other teacher was saying about you. I was like, yeah. He's like, man, she does not like you. I'm like, who, who? I was like, who was it? And uh, he's like, I'm not going to tell you. I was like, all right. And he goes, you know, I just couldn't believe it, though, because – I was like, Mike is awesome. I have no idea what she's talking about. But <laughs> what's funny is I, I feel like there were there were a lot of teachers that were either in one camp or the other. I, I had some really, really uh, fantastic teachers, some of which I still keep up with today. I, it's funny because my second grade teacher, Mrs. Jones, still follows me on Facebook. I, I definitely hope I get to reconnect with her when I go back to Connecticut. Uh, wonderful, wonderful lady. I just, yeah, so grateful I had her as my second grade teacher. But – you know, they, some teachers would have this opinion of me. They'd be like, oh, Mike is a great student, very, very thoughtful, uh, you know, uh, enjoy enjoy him in class. And then the other teacher was like, oh, I, mm, 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 mm. and I'm like, eh, I was probably sleeping through that class. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so to prove to the teachers that, you know, I guess the ones that really didn't care for me, they're like, he's never going to make anything for himself. I'm like, ah, you know, I'll, I, I did okay. So uh, there's that, and then there's the uh, the Happy Gilmore thing. And yeah. what, let's hear about that. What does this mean? So the Happy Gilmore thing. So if you remember, towards the end of Happy Gilmore, he gets hit by a, a Volkswagen bug. Okay, so he's driving. You know, he gets the guy that yells "Jackass!" You know, as he hits him. So you know, messes up Happy's shoulder when he hits the ground. Then Happy get he's getting looked over by the doctor. <clears throat> And I, I should be able to uh, say this verbatim, but I'm going to screw it up slightly. So he, he says, uh, you know, he's like, you, you know, you definitely should not play. He's like, I'm going back out there. And he's like, what do I know? I'm just a doctor. So the fact that he says, what do I know? I'm just a doctor. I want to, uh, you know, probably throw out some advice for which I'm completely unqualified for. Be like, hey, see me. Look closer to the camera real quick. Yeah. Yeah. You got you got a spot right there. Yeah. I, I'm just, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's anything to worry about, but maybe, maybe get a look. Oh, no, you, you don't want to get a look at that. What do I know? I'm just a doctor. Yeah. there you uh, go. Or, you know, even just as an example, uh, as someone that's okay. I banned a burger place. I would not eat there for an entire year okay, after I went there and I, I wanted a double cheeseburger. Okay. Now, to me, a double cheeseburger, it, it's, a, it's a double. So it's a 100% increase on the original size of the patty. <laughs> yes, agreed. So I get the burger, and I, I look at it, and I'm like, hmm, this looks kind of funny. So I pull, I take the top of the bun off, and I look at it, and it was the, the second patty was smaller. 
Ah. And uh, mm. I, I, I said, hey, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, why is this patty smaller? She's like, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a large patty and a medium patty. I'm like, oh, what? Well, that's, not a, that's not a double. She's like, yeah, yeah, it's a double. I was like, no, that's a 66% increase. That's not a, that's not a 100% increase. And then she said, well, that, that's a double. I said, okay. And I didn't eat there for a year. Mm. Uh, so, hell, I don't even know. Uh, okay, here's why I got on that tangent. <clears throat> I could push the burger back and you're like, what do I know? I'm just a doctor. Just uh, a doctor. And then, yeah. And, 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 I, and I say that, you know, I... I'm not such an such an arrogant person, right? I, I mean, you know that about me, right? I, I don't take yeah. life too seriously. Yeah. So I'm not going to, you know, demand any certain level of respect or anything like that. I, I, I think it's fine if someone wants to be called doctor, but I'm not going to look down on people. Let me put it that way. I'm no better than anyone else in any, um, in any sense. Uh, so, gosh. You know, when I was, this is, this is probably a totally different tangent, Simeon, but that's, let's that's hear, fine. let's go for it. I, I figured, you know, as I'm going through like New York city, so there's a, you know, a fair, fair amount of homeless individuals, or as I've come to start use, use, utilizing the terminology uh, in transition, I think that's the, I don't know who started coining that, but that's the terminology uh, folks have been using. So okay. a lot of individuals in transition and I look at, I never really looked, I, I didn't look down on people. Okay. However, I didn't fully utilize my empathic abilities. So I wasn't fully turning on my empathy when I was trying to see what those individuals are going through. And now knowing how many individuals that are living with mental illnesses are in transition, or if you want, if you want to say homeless, uh, I just, I really think as a society, like how, how do we do better? How do we more adequately uh, support individuals that are living with mental illnesses? I, you know, I kind of, I, I kind of went off on a tangent there. However, it's, uh, you, you never know, you, you never know what someone is going through. So why, why not be nice to everyone? Why treat anyone? Why treat anyone poorly? Why think that you're better than anyone else? I, you know what I'm going to get? I am going to get this. I don't know. I got a bunch of tattoo ideas, right? So I got the, yeah, let's hear it. the I got the, this too shall pass with a, with a, the Batman logo on my chest. And it's funny. My counselor at one point went, you know, Mike, for all the people that you try to save, you would think you'd have like a superhero tattoo on your chest. And I was like, eh, well, actually I, actually I have a Batman, Batman, Batman. There tattoo you go. Chest. So I've got the Batman tattoo. I've got the, the chrono strength on my right arm, but I, I want somewhere. I want to put, um, Memento Mori. And, mm. you know, that is what, oh gosh, what at this point, what, what Roman emperor was it? Uh, I don't think it was Caesar. I, pro I probably should. I should have a little uh, like crib notes here I, and I should memorize these things. However, uh, once you, you know, get the tattoo, you'll have to know. Yeah, I'll have to know, right? You'll have, have to know. know. So, but he would, he would have his, uh, his servant whisper in his ear, you know, Memento Mori. So, you know, remember that y you, you will die. Uh, mm. So this isn't uh, this is kind of like uh, a fleeting state, right? Wherever mm -hmm. you're at today, you know, you're only, you know, how far away mm. are we really from living in transition or being homeless ourselves? You know, or just uh, being dead or just being dead. There you go. Yeah. 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 No longer occupying these meat sacks. Mm. So and that's a that's a Dan Cummins thing right there. Phenomenal stand up comedian. I, I uh Oh, I'm, as I'm getting notifications from uh, from one of the lifters that is obviously not watching the uh, the live stream right now, yeah, trying to tell, yeah, sending so, me messages about his close grip bench press. Yeah, so those of you that aren't in the team Kronos Strength, Mike leads a team of lifters all across the United States, and basically they're they'll post their myself included, you know, post our workout on uh, Instagram, tag Mike. Mike critiques it, and he's been growing with a lot of these individuals. We were talking the other day in the group chat, and Mike, I asked you who was the the longest person that you've been coaching, and I can't remember, but I remember I want to say it was since 2015 that was he it had, that uh, that he had been in the in the group. Uh, I think it was 16. I think I think I started was it coaching, 16? coaching. Okay, yeah, I think I started coaching Matt in 16. Okay, well there you go. Yeah, it was Matt. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I think man. I started coaching in 16. And I think 
I think now we have about 35 people on the team, men and women. Yeah. So you, you, know, you talked about when you were in your younger high school days that yeah. physical activity really wasn't something that you were drawn to. So now it's obviously a massive part of your life. And so now today, what's your stance as far as to a younger person, the importance of physical activity towards mental health, confidence, you know, any of that? Where, where do you stand Man. right now? Man, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't prep me with these questions so that I could, I yeah. could do this on the fly. I, good. I just I just want you to give it. Because and while you think, let me because now I'm I've got our kids are all training now. You know, yeah. they're working out at Indunamu and Drew does a great job with them. And it's it's great for me to see like Kingston, my son, he's nine, he's very sensitive, like his father, very passionate. And I'll see him break down, you know, when he's trying to the bar on his back, you know, it, mm. it's uncomfortable and uh, he, he just can't get underneath and can't get set. But he does. He eventually gets it. But he wants to be he wants to nail it right out the gate and he struggles. And then just to he gets emotional and cries and then Drew works with him through it. But I'm just glad that he's able to work through those things and have his failures now that he is younger so he can see, hey, you know, strong people fail and it makes us stronger. So, yeah. <sighs> okay. Uh, you can go to a couple different directions with this. I don't yeah. know that it's, you know, especially in terms of your son having uh, an emotional reaction when he, when he fails to do something. I don't know that that's necessarily that much different uh, than coaching, than coaching adults. And I think it, you're right. It is. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Coaching is really. Okay. So I sent you guys a spreadsheet, right? <clears throat> Roughly yeah. once every four weeks. And that is, I don't know, 10 to 20% of the process. I mean, it's very, it's a very, very small portion of, of the overall coaching process because the, the coach client coach athlete relationship whatever you want to call it is it's it's the r word right so it's it it is a relationship uh, a relationship just like any other so you have to you have to figure out what the needs of that individual are so for the 35 people on the team they all get the same basic template right <laughs> because i got to a point when we had ella and i, I think at that i think around then i was coaching about about 20 individuals with so 20 individual programs. Some of them are similar, but a lot of them were, you know, one person's competing this week, another person's competing this week. So it just got, it, it got overwhelming. The idea of just developing a template for the whole team. And then we all kind of move through a training cycle together has allowed me to continue coaching and continue helping people get stronger while also not <clears throat> completely overwhelming myself. But each one of you, on the team ha has different needs, right? So, uh, you know, uh, let's let's take Simeon for an example. So, you know, when you when you started training a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I gave you a hard time about not posting videos, right? Yeah. And why why did I give you a hard time about that? Uh, because I well, I thought about that too, and I think uh, I think one of it is so you can see how my form is, but mm -hmm. also I think it's about so I can. Uh, well, I, I can't think of the word that it's like, uh, mm, I don't know. But so so I see myself and I can yeah. document my growth um, along the accountability. That that was the word I was looking for. So for some of the some of the athletes on the team, like I, I'm an accountability partner, right? I'm making sure that uh, that you're showing up. And I just I like to have I, I know there are some people on the team that regardless if they're posting or not, they're training. Doesn't matter. I mean, I don't have to – Matt's a great example, okay? Matt, I've been coaching for four years. I don't have to – if I don't see a post from Matt every couple of weeks, uh, Matt, Matt posts sometimes like a weekly wrap-up. But for the most part, Matt doesn't post as frequently as someone like I do. I know that Matt will post without fail a couple times a month. He'll talk about just generally what, what's going on with his training. But he's putting in the work every single day. I know that he's doing that. 
there are other people on the team that if I don't see a post from them, I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. So I'll reach out and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I kind of had a rough week. I'm like, that's cool. Are you back in there tomorrow? They're like, well, I'm like, okay, are you back in there Monday? I'm back in there Monday. Okay. okay. I, I, I'm looking forward to your post. So I, I make sure I put that, you know, in my head. I'm like, like with you, when I told you that day, I'm like, start posting videos again. Yeah. When I saw that video, I was like, awesome. Good. You know, it doesn't, the weight really doesn't matter. Okay. You know, there's going to be a, there's going to be a point in my life, I mean, where the, the plates are going to come off as opposed to, as opposed to keep going up. Right. I'm going to okay. hit that wall. Okay. I hope, I hope that it's not for another 10 or 15 years. Uh, I, I really, I look at someone like Mark Felix, that's 53 years old, still competing at world's strongest man. Mm. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to be that good in all likelihood. Cause I don't know if you've ever seen Mark Felix's hands, but here's my hand. And then here's Mark Felix's hand. It's like two of mine. But I, I have to be okay with that. And I have to be okay going, hey, you know, here's where I'm at today at 55 years old. But if I'm still pulling over 500 in my 50s, I'm cool with that. 600 would be cool. Um, yeah. Dang, but, man. But you have, to, you have to meet individuals where they're at. So going back to, gosh, teaching, teaching younger folks the importance of – taking care of themselves. So you have to look at the, you have to look at the whole person, right? So not okay. everyone, I, I wish everyone want, want to have a barbell in their hands, but they might not. And, and that's okay. But I think some sort of baseline level of physical fitness, you know, helps, you know, it's going to help you, you physiologically, it's going to help you mentally. For many, it's going to help them spiritually, you know, connect with themselves, connect with the world, connect with the higher power. <clears throat> But there, there are so many benefits to just you know, just getting out walking, right? You know, going out, go, go on a hike. I, I, I mean, I think anything besides me just you know just sitting in my chair, just playing video games as a mm -hmm. kid, and, and not getting up or doing anything, or getting up and like going to the bathroom or going up and getting more food. The opposite of you know anything further on the spectrum towards uh, towards where I'm at now is good. You know, so push up, sit ups, something, you know, and then you find out what they enjoy. What's up? You got to get the question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I've noticed that anytime I've, I've worked with you in a lot of different um, roles, you know, like we've been coach and student, and then we've worked a lot of videos together. 2020, we've done almost a video every month, you know, yeah. documenting your progress towards United States Strongman Nationals, which got pushed back this year, and it's going to be coming on next year, hopefully. Um, but each time there's been like, uh, you know, like whether we're talking about deadlines with the videos or we're talking about reviewing the um, workout footage or getting back into the gym, every time it's been this consistent, um, empathetic vibe. You know, I, do you ever switch over to like, uh, you know, like the hard ass, the hard ass coach or like dropping the hammer or, or is it always just kind of like, a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I hope Ricky is watching right now. Ricky, come on, Ricky, yeah, chime in. Ricky, I know you're out there. Yeah, Ricky will know, I, you know, I really, not very often. Okay. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Hamby about six or seven years ago was doing a farmer's walk with 220 a hand. I think, I think it's when my farmers were 130 a piece and he had, he had a 45 pound plate on a, on each post. So I think it was 220, 223 per hand. <clears throat> and if I recall, I wanted him to go a hundred feet. And I think I yelled, Hamby, if you drop this, I'll kill you. And he dropped it. No, he did not. No, okay. no. Okay. I, I, I mean, he absolutely redlined and finished the set. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he legitimately worried I was going to kill him. Uh, so there was that. And a couple of ooh, a couple of years ago, I was coaching in here. And I'm not uh, – like I mentioned to you before, I'm not super cocky. I don't try to do the whole, like, the whole alpha male thing all the time. But there, there comes a point where – you know, if I'm 
providing advice or guidance, you know, I need to kind of like, I, I need to be the one doling that out. Right. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm the best coach that I'm the only coach, but if I'm in my gym providing guidance to someone that I coach, like, yeah, you know, back off a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, I was coaching someone during a set and someone else chimed in mm, and cool. had chimed in a little too much. And I might've, uh, I might've said like, Hey, I got it. And I think that's probably the only, the most stern that I've ever, that I've ever gotten. And I think other than that, the only time that I really get, uh, loud is mm -hmm. probably like a safe is a safety thing so if okay. someone's about okay. to get run over by a yoke or there's a who's to fell stone and someone's going to drop you know someone's going to drop it on someone's foot that and really that's the only um that's the only time that i really see to you know to get loud i really i'm not a i don't know i you know there was a time where i thought that you know we could we could talk about toxic masculinity all day ah, but there was ah. a time that i that I really thought that getting loud, you know, kind of, I don't know, peacocking, you know, not in the mm -hmm. sense of like Mark, Mark, Warble, Wa Mark Wahlberg and the other guys yelling, I'm a peacock, let me fly. Yeah. But just like showing your feathers and just being like, look how tough, look how badass I am. You know, there's just, there's no need for that. Uh, so there was a time when I guess I, I, I thought that being that loud and that more serious person was, you know, was appropriate, but really like, that's just not me. Like, I'm not like that. So, you know, you, you know, you would hear me yelling and you'd be like, Mike yells. They're like, that's strange. Like I never, yeah. uh, you know, Mike's always just uh, cracking jokes. Talking about getting a doctor because of happy Gilmore, things like that. You know, let's take a second and say hello to everybody who is watching us live right now. We've got Brad is in there, Jeremy, Ricky, Dennis. Um, let's see who else we got in there. <laughs> Star show. Oh, oh, Crystal called me out though about getting mad. Uh oh, you kicked a fan one time? What was that? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. No, I, I, oh, God, that was a terrible memory. Mm. But a memory nonetheless. So um, what did I do? So I'm benching in the corner over here, okay? I've got 330 on the bar. You remember these things that you had, like, there you go. Like a profound reaction to. <clears throat> so I'm in the corner. Crystal is spotting me. We have probably been dating... I don't know, maybe a year. So this is, uh -oh. I think this is 2012. <clears throat> I was going for the third rep on 3.30. I had missed it two weeks in a row. And Crystal grabbed the bar mm. as it slowed down. Mm. So that's a, a, gosh, and I'll give Ricky a little bit. of Ricky grabbed the bar a little bit early, uh, earlier this year. Uh, <laughs> he felt super bad. I didn't kick a fan, though. But after Crystal did it, I got up and I kicked the fan and I broke it in half. And I looked back at Crystal and, and she was definitely scared. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm such an asshole. Um, so, yeah, I definitely regret doing that. Oh, um, man. But that no. was that's a part of me that I, you know, when I was younger, I definitely I would I didn't break a ton of controllers, but I got pissed off at a few games when I was younger and. You know, it, it's not an appropriate reaction, but I broke a couple of controllers. You know, and if my buddy Mike was watching right now, he could tell you how, how mad I got playing multiplayer and red faction. Yeah, uh, so so that yeah. was something I was surprised to learn about yeah. you was Zelda and yeah. Nintendo and all of this. I I I don't know. I just had this idea or this vision of Mike as weights work for the Department of Defense family go to sleep you know, like there's nothing yeah. ever other than that and then it's like oh yeah i'm a big gamer I'm like what where did that you come know, from and what i haven't spent enough time playing games is when i haven't what uh when i'm failing to really decompress and take care of myself so there are times where you know i would i would get in I would just get in months or just get weeks and months of just grinding. And there, there's a time, sure, you, you got to run a marathon or you've got to, you know, do a sprint for a couple of days, whatever. But I would get into modes where I was just doing that too often. And you, you know, at least I would notice about myself, like my temper would get shorter. I'd be more tired. I wouldn't be as fun to be around. I wasn't really happy. So I... I, I, I can 
really just like decompress and relax when I play games. And I, I've always really enjoyed, I really enjoy the storylines. I really enjoy a well, I really enjoy a well-crafted masterpiece. And I'm not ashamed to admit, and if Keith is watching this right now, he gets it. But when I finish Uncharted 2 this summer, oh, Uncharted 2, oh my God, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just so like, not Uncharted 2. Uncharted 2 is, was good, but like, no, The Last of Us Part 2. So when I finished The Last of Us Part 2, and there's a scene at the end where, where they're sitting on this bench, and I was just, I wasn't weeping, but I was definitely crying. Wow. And this is like 1 o'clock in the, nah, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. And Crystal came home, I was just like, damn, that was so good. And until that moment, I didn't realize how, gosh, there was so much controversy surrounding The Last of Us Part 2. Just because people didn't like the direction that, that Naughty Dog went with the storyline. But I, in my opinion, I think it was the I think it's the best game ever made. I really do. Wow. I, okay. I gotta yeah. check this out. Yeah. So oh uh, you know, I from the moment I finished The Last of Us in 2013 until I played The Last of Us Part Two in 2020, when I would think about certain moments in The Last of Us, I, I would I would have a physiological reaction. Like I would actually, I would get, if I want, if I wanted to get really like sort of cerebral in training, Mm. I mean, I could listen to the soundtrack from either of the games and I I could easily get goosebumps. Uh, I I mean, it really is. It it is that much of an experience. I got to check this thing out. Yeah, no. So naughty dog. Okay. So they developed, I don't know if the first series was crash bandicoot, but they went from crash bandicoot, to Jack and Daxter, to Uncharted, to The Last of Us. And there were, you know, there was a Last of Us and then there was Uncharted 4. <clears throat> then they came back to The Last of Us Part 2. And now they're going to do it in The Last of Us series on HBO, which I hope they do it. I hope they do it justice. I think they did a great job with HBO. Like HBO did a great job with, uh, with George R.R. R. Martin's a, a Song of Ice and Fire. And I'm not going to call it a Game of Thrones because that's not what the series is called. The, okay. the show is called game of thrones but that's not okay. this the series is called a song of ice and fire i hope it's not fire and ice someone will correct me if i'm wrong yeah on that i don't one, i'm i'm learning right now man you're taking me to school i think mike just closed himself out of the the chat while he was trying to read you guys his chats so let me i'm going to send an invite over to mike one more time to get him back into the show but yeah guys along this route please let us know um, any questions or comments that you have for Michael Badalino, it's uh, it's always awesome to have him to talk with him again. Like like we were saying, he's been uh, over the over this last year. Mike and I have been doing a documentary series about his quest to become the United States strongest man in the middleweight division. So it's it's just um, it's it's been great. We started it. Man, I want to say it was in uh, January. Some oh, there's there's Mike right there. He's back. So, so Mike, uh, when did we start that uh, series? I think we started in January. January. Okay, yeah. yeah so yeah. started it in January, and we yeah. we pushed through a lot of episodes. You guys look those up online on YouTube, Mike Badalino, and just just type it in, and you'll see it. Or just go to my YouTube channel, YouTube Simeon Hendrix, and you'll see the series right there. But yeah, so Mike's on the quest, and it's been awesome working with him as much as I have, getting to know him and getting to be part of Chrono Strength. And yeah, so Mike, um, did you did you go to read a comment and you cut yourself out? Is that what happened? I, th- I think it was something. Yeah, I think it was something like that. And uh, since you brought since you brought up nationals, yeah, you know it's uh, man, I just. And I told Crystal this uh, some time ago, maybe a couple months, but I really, I really didn't realize. I loved training. I loved the process, but there's something about competing and leaving it all out there. And, and there's another, there's another gear that I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know that if it's if it's if it's something in here uh, that doesn't kick on, like you don't kick into that gear until you get to a competition. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing because if you're gonna, if you're gonna go all out, 
you do it at a competition. Like that's why I don't, I, I don't practice doing 10 RPE deadlifts. Like I, I don't do it intentionally in training. I mean, if you're going to do a 10 RPE deadlift and you know, you're going to go so hard that you almost pass out, you do that in competition. You don't do that. You don't do that in training regularly because it's just not, I don't know, it's just not a great practice. So I, I just, uh, I look back on the last competition that we had and, uh, Although I did do that powerlifting meet, I started that powerlifting meet in November of, of last year, but I, I stopped halfway through because I was just so sick that it was just, it wasn't a smart call. Like, I'm like, this is, this is a bad idea. So I just finished coaching, went home and went to sleep. Uh, but my last full competition was that, was the Panhandle Strongest Man. What was it? August, October 26th, I believe, 2019. <clears throat> and Ricky and I just had an awesome time driving down at, when we start the drive at like five o'clock in the morning and I had two pounds to lose. Cause for whatever reason, you know, I got, I'd woken up the day prior to the competition exactly at two twenty. Well, I woke up the day of the competition or the day of the weigh in at two twenty two, <clears throat> So I was two pounds over and Ricky and I drove the, what do you think? It's like four hours or something like that. Uh, with the, the, the heat was so hot in the truck that our phones shut off okay oh my gosh it was oh terrible. like it, it came up and was like heat alert that oh that yeah thing. yeah Whoa. it was bad and okay. ricky is like i forget what temperature ricky figured out phones I, he's, shut off he's at. commenting in the comments okay. with like a puke <laughs> heat face it was so, so bad oh my gosh wow but i uh you know the last 10 minutes i was like bro i don't know if i can make it and uh, I just, I think I turned on the Rocky soundtrack. I th- I'm pretty sure it did. And we got there and I, I just like, we stumbled out of the car. I weighed in at 219.8. So I made weight. Wow. And then I was wow. like, I got to get some food. Um, and we went to Chick-fil-A right after that. And I was like, all right, that will have been worth it <clears throat> as, long, as long as I win tomorrow. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I had the, probably the best competition I've ever had the next day. Um, but yeah, that feeling, the feeling of, you know, just from event to event, like here's, here are the points, here's where I'm at. I know this guy's good at this event. You know, I, I need to make up some points here. I can't come out any lower than third here. It was a, it was an all out day. I mean, I was totally wrecked when it was done, but God, I miss that feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I think about nationals pretty much every single day. Maybe not quite as much every day. Um, you know, some days more than others. Maybe I look at the farmer's walk and I'm like, oh, man, what what time am I going to put in when I get there? But sometimes I'll just feel the bar and, uh, you know, I'll visualize myself. What do I need to do on that day? And, so, I mean, no miracles are happening now, <laughs> between now and in June, is it June 5th or June 6th of 2021? There aren't any miracles that are happening, okay? Yeah. I I need to stay healthy. I need to keep training. I need to get stronger. But I'm not going to make these you – know, I'm not going to go from a, a two, 260 log press to a 320 log press or something ridiculous like that, right? I, I've talked to you before about setting smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-oriented, or time-bound. And it's just – it's not a smart goal. But what I can do is I can, you know, over the next over the next month or so, and I actually looked at the dates today. So if we started, we'll start a 10-week training cycle the first week of January. We'll have a one-week anarchy week or deload, whatever folks want to take. And then we'll uh, we'll restart. We'll do another 10 weeks. We'll have a deload, and then we'll, we'll uh, cruise into the competition. And I'm really – you know, it is not the most important thing in the world. I mean, there are lots, there are way more important things. Okay. So I, I, I'm well, I'm cognizant of that. However, uh, it would be awesome uh, if we were at a place where, you know, in our country where uh, we were able to safely get up there and really? compete in Minnesota and the, the 10 of us on the team that are, that are qualified uh, can just be together and just compete and, and yes, the number one goal is to win. Okay. But I'm also aware that if someone that's just 
far more talented than me and that has worked equally as hard shows up and pulls 10 reps on the 605 deadlift, what am I supposed to do? Like, am I supposed to go in the locker room and cry because I, I, I can't, I cannot do that. Like I can't will myself to pull seven more reps than I'm capable of. I will do the best that I can on that day. Um, and I know about where I'll end up for myself, but I, I can't control what anyone else does. If I go out there and I have the day of my life and I crush everything to my capabilities and I end up in seven who cares, mm-hmm. you know, uh, do I really, <clears throat> would I rather have that day or would I rather have the other six people that finished ahead of me not show up? I mean, what does that, what does that yeah. say about me? Yeah. You know? Uh, so why don't I just like, I'll leave it all out there. If I, if I'm healthy, if I'm strong, <clears throat> if I, uh, if I use good strategy, then, you know, you see what happens. What but I just want to have a good time. Yeah, go ahead. What, what drives you more? The, mm. the, or what drives you most? The, the feeling of <laughs> the way your body feels physically from, from pushing it as hard as you do and, and, and the such, or the, the hate or the disgust or whatever that word is for, the opposite for what it feels like when you don't move your body, when you do get into that sloth, like just yuck, which one of those motivates you more like staying away from that gross or, or that other thing? You know, I don't even know that. uh, I don't think that. Have you ever been to the gross Mike? Come on. Have have you ever tasted (laughs) the gross? Fucking come over and see what the gross feels. I like. don't. I don't <laughs> know. I, I don't. I don't think I have since. Probably since you know, because I when I lost all that weight, I, I didn't do it in a healthy way when I was a kid, right? So I, that was a, that was exercising to change who I was because I hated who I was. Okay, and that wasn't a good. It wasn't a good path. Uh, and I don't know, I don't even know how I figured out that that wasn't a good idea for me, for me, like that, that that those motivations, uh, were not good for my mental health, but at some point I I just figured out that, um, you know, I really just, I, I, I enjoy doing this because I want to do this and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. And, you know, I have a, I have a team of people that look to me to help them get stronger. And I'm like, man, uh, Mm -hmm. how do I, you know, how do I honor that? Well, I, Mm -hmm. I make sure I still work my ass off Mm -hmm. if I expect them to. And I constantly strive to, you know, get to whatever, because here's what, here's what I know. I'm not as good as I'm ever going to be. I haven't gotten there yet. Okay. I have a lot more, that I am capable of. There is a there is a realistic threshold for me. Okay? I am not a, you know, there are people that would tell me, well, like, oh, you don't think you could beat Half Thor Bjornsson's eleven hundred and two deadlift record? I'm like, listen, there is almost no no amount of, you know, maybe if I had an adamantium skeleton like Wolverine. Uh, there, there's this, the slightest possibility that with the right cocktail of performance enhancing drugs and an adamantium skeleton <clears throat> that I could break that deadlift record, but that's not what I'm shooting for. I'm shooting for what is the, what is the most that Mike Badalino can deadlift in this lifetime, given the, the amount of work that I'm, that I'm willing to put in, you know, what am I, what am I willing to sacrifice in order to get to that point? Cause I've already you know, like I showed you before, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sacrifice my family. I'm not going to sacrifice my body past a, past it to an unhealthy point where I'm never going to recover from that. Right. So I'm not going to, uh, like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not willing to get on drugs to do that. I'm not willing to, you know, ignore the needs of other people around me in order to just focus on myself. I'm going to focus on myself, the, the amount that I feel I should be putting into this. Uh, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Wherever I end up, I've got to be okay with that. Okay. You know? So along those, along those route, along that yeah. message. 
So mm-hmm. then with this goal inside of you being so mm-hmm. strong and understanding what you are willing to sacrifice, mm-hmm. then the thought of, you know, cause you've been a big dude, you've weighed almost 300 pounds, you know, oh, I weighed so, 300. Okay. I you're it. at 300. So we're, yeah. I'm right now I'm, I'm barely under 280, you know? Yeah. So I think we can relate at some level to a, a very strong desire to wanting to just eat cake or whatever that thing was for you. Yeah. You know, so, so and that's got, not gone. That's still there. Okay. So, so how, so let's talk about balancing that. Yeah. I'm going to go down this road of demolishing food versus like this goal right here that I'm trying to get up to, you know, and why do you think you've never gotten off the rail? You know, I know you've, you've weighed, you've, you, I'm sure you've wavered. We, we're humans, you know, but 10 years, 15 years putting it in and you have no end in sight, you know, just talking with you, you know, you, like this is a long-term dedication. Um, whatever comes to mind off of that. So I won't say that I haven't wavered because when I was, when I had, I've always had a, an interesting relationship with food. Okay. Let me put it that way. So, you know, I, when I was younger, when I was in high school and I was just, you know, I, I really, I probably should have been diagnosed as, I think because I exercised to like purge myself, I probably would have been, it, it would have been closer, like, the characteristics of someone that had uh, was living with bulimia. Okay. But I, you know, I would eat like a bowl of cereal in the morning. I'd eat a protein bar during the day and I d- eat dinner and nothing in between. So I had the discipline to do that, but it also created some significant mental health challenges for me where, you know, even coming off of that and even starting to eat a more healthy amount of food, uh, was challenging and it didn't help when I was in the military and I had to do PT tests and I had to get waist measurements and I had a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety from that. And the, the, well, honestly, what helped me the most in that situation was just separating from the military. And that wasn't, that wasn't the driving reason for me separating, but God, I'll tell you the not worrying about getting my waist measured and having that potentially mm. affect my career Mm. Um, yeah, that, I I mean, that caused me a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. And I will tell you, I could have made the choice to, to lose a ton of weight. I could have, okay. And I could have done that. However, I, I liked the powerlifting stuff that I'd started to do. I wanted to continue to do that. And I didn't want to spend the next 12 years of my life, um, yeah, just worrying about a tape measure every six months. I just didn't want to do that. So once I separated in 2013 is when I got I got to my biggest from, let's see, 13 to 16. I went from about 275 to, I think at the end of 2015, I was 297 or 298. Wow. Okay. And then... 2016, the summer of 2016, I was about 285 or 288, and I did my last heavyweight, um, like platinum plus strongman competition. I actually did one the next summer, but I was down to 265, so I don't really count it like that. But I did my last like super heavyweight uh, competition, and I had a really good. It was a good day. I had a really good day, but I. You know, I made a decision after that competition. I said, you know, I, I really just want to see how I feel a little bit lighter. <laughs> and I got to 265, and I was like, well, <sighs> actually, I know exactly what happened. So I got to 265. I lost a bunch of strength because I was really just focused on losing the weight. And, uh, you know, I was like, well, Strongman Nationals are coming up. I can't do the weights as a heavyweight. Why don't I just drop the middleweight? So in June-ish, June, yeah, June of um, – maybe late June of 2017, I just said, oh, I'm just going to compete as a middleweight. So I signed up that day as a middleweight to commit myself to dropping another uh, roughly roughly 30 pounds 
so that I could weigh in at Strongman Nationals as a middleweight for my first competition. And I did. And I liked the way that I looked. I liked the way that I felt. And, yeah, there are times, and I even told Ricky a couple weeks ago, I said, you know, and I haven't put, you know, off the, you know, I haven't put it off the table that if I, in the next couple of years, I can't get much stronger than I am now. Mm-hmm. I would consider gaining 10 or 15 pounds back as long as I could do it, you know, slowly in a, in a healthy way, because really at, at, at six feet tall, I'm pretty light for a strong man. I mean, being yeah. a six foot tall, uh, middleweight is, you know, a lot of middleweights will walk around at more like 250. I just, I can't do this. Okay. Not that I can't, I choose not to do those crazy weight cuts. I, I, yeah. I, I just, I don't want to, uh, there are people that, that really, uh, you know, a lot of them just seem to have a wrestling background. So they're used to doing kind of extreme weight cuts. Some of them don't, some of them just like the challenge of an extreme weight cut. I don't like that. And there are, you know, there are some consequences to your body of doing that. And if you want to take it, cool. I'm not here to judge. I choose not to do that. So I'm not going to get very much above uh, my weight class or my weight limit. You know, that's why if I'm going to compete as a 220 or 231, I like staying in that sweet spot of like 224 to 227. Um, uh, last time when we yeah. talked about your diet, you had talked yeah. about you were on the, I think it's, I, I what is that? Periodization? Did I do yeah. renaissance? I was, yes. Yeah. Are, you, are you still doing that? No, no. Now I just, uh, man, I just kind of eat to continue my training and not gain weight. So okay. I, I know about how much I need to take in for my activity level in order to recover in order to just feel good. Uh, Mm -hmm. so that, that's, that's what I do now. And I, I, I'd say I eat 85 to 90% like clean foods, you know, cheesecake, not being a clean food, but cheesecake is one of my favorite things. So, you know, I'm not the week of my birthday. Okay. I chose to, because Ricky bought me a cheesecake every day after my training session, I choose, chose to leave a few hundred calories so that I could eat cheesecake. Okay. So you are you using like my fitness pal or something like this? <laughs> I or would if I had a uh, no, I did in the beginning. I, I stopped a couple of years ago because I've really been able to modulate my, my weight pretty well on my own. Uh-huh. But it's it's taken time. I mean, when I was <clears throat> when I was a lot heavier, I was just like, man, I just need to eat a ton of meat. And I was eating like gosh, I was eating two to three pounds like weighed out of meat a day. Wow. And, but I didn't, I didn't feel as good. So I, I tend to respond better to higher carbs, uh, relatively high protein, and then kind of medium ish fat. I mean, I still get plenty of fat, but not, okay. I don't focus on it. Like I don't add olive oil, add butter, okay. or add a lot of peanut butter. Uh, but yeah, Renaissance periodization, that was what, because the diet template was so easy. I just, I, I went through, you know, the, the different cut sequences and it just, it, it, the weight just came off. And I also did like additional cardio. And when I'm focused on something, I, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. So I, I, I said that, you know, I would not do any um, cheat meals unless it was on a like Saturday right after my training session. And I would do my one cheat meal. And I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of mental health, benefits to doing like the 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 focus cheat meal you're like all right i'm gonna do one thing but okay you want to read an awesome article go back and look up dave tate's amazing cheat day okay okay don't do it if you're already not feeling good uh because it will make you sick reading how okay so if you think that you've had an epic cheat meal you need to read dave tate's epic just dave tate cheat meal if you right. type that right. in, we're gonna look that it's up. A, it's a blog article from probably 2008 or 2009, maybe even older. And uh, he talks about his diet coach gave him. He said, "Hey, eat whatever you want." It was either in one meal or in this many number of hours. Unbelievable the amount of food that he consumed. And I've been there a little bit because I, you know, when I when I had a worse relationship with food, I would binge. And I don't remember – I'm grateful that I, I don't even remember the last time I did binge on something because uh, I don't like the way that that makes me feel. So I just go – you know, 
like even on Thanksgiving, you know, yesterday, I know there's kind of this, uh, this allure to having like a gigantic meal. Oh, is that it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there dude, you go. Dude. So worth it. Please let me know your thoughts. If you watch. Yeah. So you guys um, yeah, check that out. Oh gosh. It's disgusting. It's, but the commitment that he has to making sure that it's an epic G meal is pretty fantastic. So Thanksgiving, you made yourself a little sick. No, um, okay. no, I just had maybe, maybe a little bit more, uh, okay. but I, the gluttony doesn't do it for me. You know, I like having mm. a big meal. I like feeling full, but I don't like stuffing my face anymore. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't like how it feels. I, I, okay. I don't like how it feels going to bed. Okay. When I weighed in, this is probably the. And I only did it because I thought I needed to eat a lot that day. Let me give you an example. I weighed in at Strongman Nationals in 2017. I weighed in at like 229, 230, under the 231.4 cutoff. I promptly went out and ate chicken and waffles, but like a gigantic tower of chicken and waffles. Mm. Okay, So I ate that. I rested uh, a couple of hours. Then I went and had a... I get double bacon cheeseburger, fries, and a milkshake. Woo. Then I rested a few more hours, and I had – I think I had a plate of ravioli. No. We're going to have pierogies. I don't know. It was good, whatever it was. Um, and then Ooh. I had – I definitely had a big appetizer, and then I had a pretty – some sort of like ice cream dessert. <clears throat> I went to bed that night with a brick in my stomach Mm. and you know, when you wake up and you're like, you know, your stomach just feels tight because you're like, I ate that much food. Yes. Uh, Yeah. I don't like that feeling. And uh, I think that was the last time that I ate like just way, way too much. Uh, Mm. So I just, I don't like the way that it makes me feel. I, I have kind of like structured cheat meals like tomorrow as an example. I'll probably eat a couple of Little Debbie Christmas trees. Yum. Okay. You got about 240 calories each, so I'll make sure to allocate uh, those calories. I'll eat about 4,500 calories today or tomorrow, so I'll uh, I'll allocate about 500 to the Little Debbie Christmas trees. Mm. Yeah, I – Yum. So there are certain things that when I eat them, okay, and I, I'm sure you know this feeling. You eat something and you're like, man, that just wasn't as satisfying. But I try to, I try to only indulge in things that after I eat them, I'm like, God, that was so worth it. Mm-hmm. So uh, okay. Reese's Reese's big cups, okay? They should get rid of regular Reese's cups because they should all be big cups. So like Reese's big cups, uh, certain pizzas. You know, I really like screaming Sicilian right now, so that that hits the spot for me. I I like screaming Sicilian after I train on Saturday. I really like those pizzas. So once a week, I'll eat pizza. Um, I love cheesecake. So periodically, if I go out to dinner, okay, if I go out to dinner and they have a cheesecake on the menu and it is made in house, I will eat the cheesecake because I want to experience that cheesecake the way that that, uh, that, that chef prepares it. Mm. If they have some, if they're like, oh, it's store bought, I'm like, no, I don't, I, I'm not going to allocate calories when I'm out at a restaurant and pay $10 for a piece of store bought cheesecake. But if I'm going to get, a high quality cheesecake made by made by someone there with love, okay, and care. I'm going to enjoy every single bite of that cheesecake. We've got another one of the episodes of our of documenting your progress throughout 2020 it is going to be coming out this weekend. It was mm. the you and Ricky. You guys are uh, maxing out. I think Lauren was there. Maybe yeah. yeah. Was she there? Yeah, she was there. So you guys are maxing out. You're going through the process. And at the very end, I I asked you. What when next year when you're watching this or when what words would you give to yourself looking back? And so in a year from now, you're looking back on this. What would you want to say to yourself? And you said, stay the course, trust the process. So, yeah, what does that mean to you? (sighs) Okay, if there's a. If I develop a plan, right. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. I know I knew I wanted to talk to you about something that I hadn't mentioned yet. Good. So 
I, I've, I've followed him loosely for a while, but there's a power lifter that I like to follow. His name is Joe Sullivan. And he, he made a post yesterday about analysis versus annihilation. Okay. It's good to analyze plans. But when you're constantly annihilating them and going, no, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this deadlift variation. Or no, I should have done strict log press, not push jerks. What was I thinking? I should have worn these elbow sleeves, not these elbow sleeves. I wore the wrong shoes. I shouldn't do this. So the, the individuals that seem to never make any progress in a strength training program, okay, one of the commonalities a lot of them have are they're constantly, I got to change this. No, I got to change this. No, I got to mm. change this. I'm not saying that as you're going through a program, you don't look at it and go, you know, that sounded good, but it didn't work in execution. Okay. Cause I do that periodically. I actually did that this week. So, uh, you know, this is our second week of the off season program. <clears throat> and of all the movements for me, I changed one thing. And I went, okay, I, I like how the glute ham raise hits my whole hamstring. Okay. And I, I want to do that at a bit, of, a bit of a higher volume versus doing single leg Romanian deadlifts. I get a better training effect from doing glute ham raises. So I chose to swap those out and I'm going to keep pressing with glute ham raise, excuse me, uh, glute ham raises. So I performed a bit of analysis on the, on the training program, as opposed to annihilating it and go, you know, I got to throw the whole thing out the window I should be doing dead bench as opposed to pause bench. No, maybe I should be doing slingshot bench. So you have to be careful where you, where you, you know, that analysis becomes annihilation and you believe that, you know, you're, you're constantly trying to, uh, you know, to change things just to get that one extra pound or that, that one extra uh, rep on a set. So yeah, when I, when I develop a plan, I want to stick with it to, to a good extent until I have uh, evidence that I should be, that I should be changing it, you know, where if I'm not making progress or something is, you know, not recovering well. Um, yeah. So the stay the course, what did I say? Stay the course, trust and, the process. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I I've done this long enough to where I, again, I, I'm not so confident or cocky in myself that I, that I think I'm the greatest coach ever. Okay. I think that I have spent a significant amount of time, Watching a lot of videos, reading a lot of training programs, reading a ton of blogs, a ton of articles, a ton of books, um, going, okay, um, what what among what I have read <clears throat> makes sense for an application in my own, you know, in my own training program? And I've, I think I've developed a bit of a unique training program because I really try to <clears throat> think about how, you know, someone, whoever coined Mike's average Joe's. I, I really like that because, you know, we're not full-time straw men, strong women competitors or power lifters, right? We're just people trying to better ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we're not going to, uh, you know, we're not playing for the Dallas Cowboys here. Our lives and our livelihood are not dependent on our bench presses. If they were, you know, Simeon, I hate to tell you, I think you and I would be out of a job. I mean, we'd bench yeah. okay, but we'd be, you know, we'd be kind of SOL. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> what I've tried to do is just put something together where, you know, you can spend a, a, a reasonably uh, short amount of time in the gym to kind of maximize, maximize your progress uh, while honoring the rest of the you know, the parts of our lives. You know, I, I really, I don't want to develop training programs where, where folks on the team are spending two and a half to three hours in the gym, destroying themselves and that not having uh, anything rest, anything left for their jobs or most importantly, their families or themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, I want the, uh, their families to have the, uh, the best of them, not the rest of them. Okay. Mm. So the whole chrono strength thing is, uh, you know, developing something where we can get stronger forever. I mean, I, I don't care at all if none of us on the team ever set a world record. I care about everyone on the team taking care of themselves and taking time off when they need it and going on a vacation when they need it and – you know, the, the progress that they're making in the gym is just helping them 
become the best possible version of themselves. That is what I care about. Mm. It doesn't, you know, oh man, I haven't hit that 405 branch press. Who cares? Why? That's, I mean, it, should self worth be correlated with a number on a bench press? Uh, it is my opinion that it should not be. Uh, but yeah, you have to have a healthy relationship with this, just like you have to have a healthy relationship with yourself and with the people that you care about. So, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. No, man, <laughs> I, I love it. And I had never thought about the fact that you consciously uh, factored in your your students' um, lives, the rest of their lives. And, you know, I've I've worked your programs. I love them. It just never clicked in my mind that, oh, man, Mike is designing these to basically be done within an hour and consciously. And uh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I <laughs> my buddy asked me the other day, one of my earlier training partners, uh, Chris, <clears throat> he's like, how long does it take you to get to your first work set? I was like, oh, like 15 minutes. He's like, so it doesn't take you like 45 minutes or an hour of rolling on the ground to get there anymore. I was like, no, because, mm. dude, I used to be like that. I used to I used to get home from work and I'd be out here for like, I don't know, three, four hours, a long time. I could imagine. Then, sure. Editing the videos, doing all my mobility work. Uh, but, you know, it's not super realistic when you're when you have a relatively challenging job and a uh, and a two-year-old and you're trying to get yeah. a doctorate and you're uh you're also trying to teach and you're trying to coach um yeah so oh, trying to spend uh, the mm. right amount of time in here i'm always trying to figure that out you know and trying to better that process so yeah. mike let's <laughs> let's talk about how are you on time oh i've got a few more minutes in my voice okay. i think all that's right about well that. let's um, well, I know we're going a little long, so thank you no, everybody who's cool. been who's been yeah. uh, tuning in and and checking this out, guys. If you want to spread this later, tell somebody about this. This is the 90th episode of Steady Focused, so you can go steadyfocused.com slash ninety, share it out from there. Of course, it'll be on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify. Mike, what we talked briefly uh, last time I was recording you working on the documentary about your future plans and mm. it involves uh, a, a desire to head back to Connecticut. Um, yeah. Tell us about that. <sighs> I don't know, man. Maybe, uh, you know, a few months ago I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And uh, I just, I really, a lot of it just, I really miss, I don't know. I really miss my brother. I really, uh, I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a huge family that I'm close with. So I've got my, my mom and my grandmother um, and my uncle. And I've, I've got some aunts and uncles throughout the country as well that we, you know, we, we still stay in contact, but the, uh, the closest person, the, the person that I'm closest with is my brother and my brother's in Connecticut and my brother's not going anywhere anytime soon from Connecticut. I mean, he's a uh, Connecticut born and raised, which is cool. Uh, you know, I went from Connecticut to England to Texas, and I really enjoyed my time here. And I think in, uh, you know, when I leave in a few years, that'll be 15 years that I'll live here. Um, but yeah, I just, I want to go back to Connecticut. I want to, uh, I, I was born at Yale. I would really like to attempt to get into Yale. They have a program that I really, uh, that, I, that I'm interested in. So wow. uh, I'm going to give that a shot. Probably. I mean, my plans could change, but that's kind of what I'm feeling right now. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't entirely know what I'm going to do. Um, you know, I'll have 20 years of service to the, to the air force and I'll have my doctorate and uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Just I'm going to do. See uh, where it goes. It kind I mean, of, I could teach. Uh, I mean, I enjoy teaching in a number of different capacities. So something with teaching, I'm sure it'll be something with that. It really kind of made me savor this time that I've gotten to know you. Um, just realizing, like, uh, of course, we're all going to be dead. We're all dying. We're all going to the same place in that aspect. But just knowing, like, okay, Mike is going to be leaving Wichita Falls. You know, like, this isn't going to be a forever that you can cruise on down to Wichita Falls and knock on Mike's garage door and go in there and, and BS. 
So yeah, it's um I think on that note, you know what? I'm I'm going to I'm going to wrap it on that. Just uh Well, let's let me leave, let me leave you with this then. Yeah, okay? hit, it. hit it. So you meet you meet people uh and they enter into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. So, I, I think uh I think we'll, we're we're in it for the lifetime there, Simeon. So, we'll we uh go. we'll 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 definitely stay uh we'll stay in touch even when I'm in Connecticut. But I like I don't remember Gosh, I can't remember who that quote is attributed to, but yeah, reason, a season, or a lifetime. And I, I think we all have those those people in our lives who are like, oh, that's why they were there to teach me that, you know, or that's why they were there with me during that season, or the person that's like, they're there till the end, you know. I don't know, I don't know if you can see this, but this is uh, all the notes that I've taken while you were talking. <laughs> So yeah, lots of good stuff. So anyway, guys, we're going to wrap it there. Everyone who's been listening at home. Um, thank you so much for list listening live. Of course, like I said, you can check this out. It's going to be archived on Spotify. It's going to be on YouTube, steadyfocused.com slash 90. You can always follow along Mike on his Instagram and Facebook at Kronos Strength or at Michael Badalino. My name is Simeon Hendricks. And guys, uh, we're going to wrap this. I hope you guys had an awesome Thanksgiving weekend. Enjoy the time with your family coming into the rest of the holidays. And uh, until next time, I'm your host. I'm your number one, Mr. Simeon Hendricks. And this is Steady Focused.